I'd like to introduce today's guest. I uh, don't think we'll be able to see John, but we'll certainly be able to hear him. Uh, the Chief Risk Officer of Boeing Employee Credit Union to our Risk Leadership uh, webinar series today. Um, this topic today is on consumer and commercial loan risk at the time of COVID. So clearly it's, uh, it's very topical, but just a little uh, intro to John's background. I got to know John uh, quite a number of years ago now. I don't know where all the time has gone. Uh, before the financial crisis, when we were both at uh, a fairly small institution that some of you may or may not have heard of, Washington Mutual. Um, got to know him before the financial crisis and observe his keen acumen uh, in terms of risk management. He's a seasoned veteran in financial services management with over 20 years experience uh, in this space. At Boeing uh, Employee Credit Union, he leads the enterprise risk, legal co governance and compliance functions at one of the largest credit unions in the country. John's also one of the unique CROs in the industry that we have today, having a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering, so it brings a true rocket scientist to our field. John, welcome to our session today, and thank you for, for joining us. Yeah, th thank you, Cliff. It looks like I got uh, my kind of backup camera going, so you'll, you'll see a view of my chin here. Uh, there you are. Yeah, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you very much. So we're going to kick this off. and. To give folks a little bit more context, uh, would you mind telling us a little bit, set the stage for us in terms of Boeing Credit Union's lending focus and profile? That is, what's the, the mix of consumer and business lending products that originate? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so BCU, so we're, we're a large credit union. We're headquartered right outside Seattle, Washington. Our footprint is really the Pacific Northwest. So we're, we're Washington, Oregon, Idaho. Uh, we also have a presence in South Carolina. We have customers that we call members all over the country. Uh, kind of for, for some sense of, of scale, so we're the fourth largest credit union in the country. We're just over $25 million in assets. I think for those of you uh, on the East Coast, we're, we're very similar in scale to, to Pentagon Federal, so another mm -hmm. large credit union. Pentagon, sure. Uh, so, and then depending on where you're situated in the country, so some parts of the country, uh, credit unions just have a small portion of the consumer market share. Other parts of the country, credit unions uh, are, are much more competitive. So in, in Washington State, actually, the majority of the consumer market goes to credit unions as compared to banks. Uh, so we're... I guess a little bit more on credit unions and as it impacts how we manage risk. So uh, we're member owned, uh, our members elect the board of directors. Practically our only form of capital is retained earnings. So there's no, there's no paid in capital stock. So we're really careful with uh, protecting that stock because we, if, if our capital is reduced or depleted in some way, it's, it's a lot harder for us to, to recover that. So we're, we kind of manage that capital at risk pretty carefully. Uh, our goal is, I mean, we're not, we're not there to generate a profit and pay a dividend, but we're kind of better rates and lower fees. So kind of looking, we still manage our risk in, in similar ways, looking out for the kind of the membership investment. But there, there are some differences as, as you would uh, see with banks. And Cliff, you and I, we both, both work for very large banks, but credit unions are a little different. So. In terms of our mix, uh, we're predominantly consumers. About 85% of our lending book is consumer. 15% uh, is in commercial. On the consumer side, uh, mortgage, uh, home equity are dominant asset classes. We, other, we also have kind of major credit card, auto, uh, kind of we have a small student lending portfolio, some other kind of smaller consumer portfolios. On the commercial side, it's, uh, it's mostly commercial real estate, and then within that, it's uh, kind of multifamily, smaller apartment buildings, although we do have office, retail, uh, other commercial exposures. So it's kind of an overview of BCU. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Uh, just one a question follow-up on, on, uh, on scale. Um, you say you're now at about $25 billion in assets. Is that... Uh, uh, has your growth trajectory been pretty steady over the last five years? Has it been uh, kind of accelerated? How, how would you characterize that? 
Uh, you know, it's been it's been pretty steady uh, uh, and, and uh, at a pretty healthy pace of growth. So I would say about 10% a year asset growth. After the Great Recession, uh, our kind of growth really took off, and that's uh, kind of a a number of factors drove that, but yeah, it's it's been pretty healthy. In this COVID event, our our uh, our balance sheet growth has really taken off. There's been a so us and other depositories. So not this one's not specific to BUCU, but uh, huge inflow of deposits. That uh, I, I think that's kind of that. I think that's temporary, and we're going to see some of the so it's liability side that's driving asset growth. Uh, I think we're going to see that some of that recede, but it's been a pretty healthy pace of growth. Kind of there, there was a period of a flight away from kind of the, the big banks right after the Great Recession, and then right. just uh, just some of the dynamics of the markets we're in. Yeah, yeah, no, no question. One of the one of one of those players that we work for uh, probably left a pretty big gap up there in the Pacific Northwest. Um, clarity today, right? Uh, COVID-19 is on everybody's minds, right? Everybody wants to understand sort of what's the biggest risk issues that keep a CRO up at night. So I'm going to start off with that one uh, and kind of get your take on on what's uh, driving your issues and kind of focus on risk management during this pandemic. Yeah, so I, I kind of think about COVID in, in three phases. So there's person operational risk phase. Then I think what we're in now is the, the very start of a, a credit risk phase. And then after that, there's going to be this uh, a phase where really the risk focuses on some strategic risks and on net interest margin. So that just to kind of break that down a little bit. So the, the first phase was kind of uh, watching it come in February. It, it hits in, in March, April. So kind of primary operational risk focuses, so health and safety, transitioning your middle and back office to working remotely in a, in a very short period of time. So network capacity and tools and, uh, and then all, all your vendor partners as well, making sure that they can support you. So credit card processors, payment networks, uh, cybersecurity support, just to all the vendors on down the line. So that was really the, the focus early on. And then we also deployed some new products very rapidly too. So uh, the, and it, in those early days, there was also some market volatility that was pretty significant. Liquidity risk was a big concern. We didn't, there was a potential for uh, consumers to really uh, draw on their lines and on the commercial side too. So. Uh, people to kind of build up cash reserves or just have a lot of cash needs. So those those kind of market volatility and liquidity risks have really abated. So I think the phase we're in now is uh, a credit risk stage. So we have very high levels of unemployment. So in our market, it got, it got as high as kind of 16, 17%. It's more like 10% now. I think it's 8% nationally. Uh, if you look at any any historical period, uh, this high of a level of unemployment would really suggest a high level of consumer credit losses. And uh, we, like pretty much everybody else, uh, we, we haven't seen that, and the reason is the, the very large scope of the federal stimulus. Mm -hmm. So that federal stimulus kind of delayed, uh, I don't know, maybe offset some of the losses we're going to experience. but. The, uh, the enhanced unemployment benefits, the $600 a week, that ended about five weeks ago, depending on what state you're in. The SBA PPP funds are starting to dry up. So I think we're starting to see uh, the, the start of the credit wave. Um, where we're seeing it a little bit, and I, I just kind of following the, the industry press, there was a big article in the Financial Times yesterday, I think, on uh, CRE. So you, you can start to see some of the, you know, a large wave of downgrades in commercial real estate. So this would be kind of retail strip malls, office properties, some of the hospitality. So I, I think you can see the start of the credit wave, but I, I think absent uh, some additional federal stimulus, which I, I think is likely, but not uh, it's not clear when and how much. Uh, 
but I, I think we're going to see something on the consumer side. Uh, another reason to think, kind of thinking about this phase two of, of credit, another reason to think, uh, and I, I, know I, I should add, I've seen a couple lenders start to, to loosen up in their underwriting. So I, I think there is a minority camp that's thinking, well, all the economic indicators are improving. I, so that we're, we're going to be on an improving trend from here. I'm, I'm not in that camp. I'm probably more pessimistic. And I think it's the, the absence of the federal stimulus, kind of that bridge to a vaccine may mm -hmm. not be long enough. But then on top of that, the, the seasonality of the virus. So as we go into the fall and winter months, the kind of the potency, the ability of the virus to spread, the mortality rates go up. So I, I think we could see some uh, some pullback in the opening up as well. They, they could kind of put additional stress on unemployment and some of the credit drivers. So then kind of thinking about kind of as, as we get into this kind of vaccine phase, most likely the, you know, I, I think of that as kind of the first half of 2021 uh, for it it to be widely available. So as we get into kind of the, the post-vaccine period, we're left with very, very low interest rates. Uh, and then we're left with kind of a, a transformed uh, customer base, both in commercial and consumer. So on the very low interest rates, the challenge there is your, uh, your variable rate products, your fixed rate products are all, they all have a very low yield. I think it's unlikely that in the United States we're going to be we're going to have negative interest rates on deposit products. So depositories, so banks and credit unions will, and I'll probably offset that with fees to some extent. But the the net interest margins are going to be depressed for everybody yeah. for a long period of time. Uh, and then it, what may be kind of the biggest long term impact is this uh, this digital transformation. So. There was already this trend of greater adoption of, of, of digital channels and then greater efficiency with end-to-end -end digitization of, of banking as an industry, but that's really accelerated here. So the, those remaining segments who still preferred to come in and, and talk to a, a teller for every transaction or even use an ATM, uh, COVID has kind of forced a lot of those segments to finally learn how to deposit checks on their phones and get more comfortable. So it's, it's not just your mobile phone app, it's kind of the, the back end behind that being scalable and efficient and digital as well. So I think the, uh, some of the smaller institutions who, who can't kind of build out that infrastructure may be, may be left behind and we could see kind of more consolidation in that next wave. So it's kind of a long answer, but I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about COVID in, in three phases and we're at the start of this credit loss wave right now. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that in a second. We're going to break that apart, looking at both the consumer and the commercial side. One of the, uh, the things, certainly having, um, you know, yeah, you'd be up there in the Pacific Northwest and given your membership footprint, you, you clearly are watching what's going on in the aviation industry that suffered so much out of this. Uh, with respect to the pandemic's impact on air travel, as well as Boeing's own issues, right, around things like the 737 MAX project and maybe 787, et cetera. And so for the foreseeable future, you know, it, it seems to me airlines are going to be struggling for quite some time to gain ground. Um, what does this mean, do you think, for, the, for that industry, its employees, some of your base, not every, all of it, but some of your base, and consumers, and how do you parse that information out when you make risk decisions about a credit union? Yeah, so, so you're right. So uh, the airline industry and manufacturers like Boeing, I mean, they're, they're saying they're going to have depressed volumes for years to come. I mean, it's going to take three or four years to recover. So then on top of that, Boeing in particular, so big impact in our market. So. Seattle is a manufacturing hub for aircraft, so the 737 MAX made in Renton, uh, 787 up in Everett, also in South Carolina where we have a presence, but yeah, both those aircraft are facing trouble. So uh, I guess partly luck, so it, it's big enough to us that, that it still matters. We still do a lot of analysis on Boeing. Uh, 
luckily, I, I think the bigger, we're fairly well diversified, but still with a geographic concentration. So we're, we do tend to be primarily Pacific Northwest. So uh, I think the Boeing exposure is partly offset by, I don't know, Amazon, Microsoft, Starbucks, uh, some of the other corporations around here. But again, we, we still pay attention to it. So if there was a scenario of, on a large scale layoffs, or they, they, so Boeing is talking about, uh, well, should we end 787 production up in Everett or in South Carolina? So, so I, I think to really analyze that, uh, the, the most important piece is kind of a, having the right credit expertise. And so that credit expertise helps build the right data environment and it, it takes time. So a data environment then, that then supports scenario analysis, stress testing. So the, I think the foundational piece is having the credit expertise who can understand kind of what the chain of events, what leads to what. So for example, we'll look at uh, our, our membership base do analysis of how many work at Boeing, how many work at specific plants, uh, family members, suppliers of Boeing. So we'll really try to get granular and understand the, the markets. Is this a layoff situation? Is it a furlough situation? So that really depends. I mean, the, the critical pieces are the credit expertise and the data. After that, kind of lining up a, a model, looking at the, the credit quality and, and the product mix and things like that is, uh, it, it's, it's all very doable after you have that foundation. So it, so it'll, it'll, so having that, having those scenarios, so that'll inform uh, kind of how we think about managing the credit risk. So do we want to do something different in our, on a line management practices where that's discretionary? So credit card lines, maybe some of the commercial products, uh, be thinking about AVM runs on our home equity lines, for example, but then also member support. So uh, bridge loan products, financial counseling, things like that. Mm -hmm. But it, it's really that, uh, that scenario analysis looking at what may happen that, yeah. that's important. Yeah, the scenario analysis and stress testing is critical these days for, for quite a range of reasons. And, and I'm guessing maybe this is another area uh, where that's employed. Fair amount of discussion, right? You, you touched on it around the fate of small and medium businesses these days, particularly around the retail, uh, restaurants and services, travel, entertainment even. And uh, I'd be interested to see, you know, what you think are the, the risks of these areas and how, how lenders are actually approaching managing those risks, both at the front end and maybe even at the back end. Yeah, so uh, I would say lending in that space, so lending to small businesses uh, kind of very cautiously right now. So, uh, I mean, Cliff, as you noted, I mean, tens of thousands of small businesses have already failed, and it's, it's restaurants, it's auto services, dry cleaners, uh, any, any business that's kind of competing head-on with uh, Amazon or uh, something with an effective online retail delivery model. So, yeah, it's a, it's a dangerous spot to be in, a, especially for kind of the, those unsecured uh, lenders supporting retail restaurants. So, uh, for us, I mean, we've, we've sort of always seen that as a more volatile category. Uh, we have a little bit of exposure, but uh, I, I think we're more, we're more fo focused on commercial, but some thoughts on how we're thinking about managing this. So uh, as we're kind of underwriting an, an incremental loan, come in with an upfront stress test. So it could be uh, the loan may hold up looking at their historical information, but what if their revenues fall? So how does, how does that impact their debt service coverage? What if their vacancy rates go up? So I know CRE office or, or multifamily, that's very relevant. So what if their vacancy rates go up? There's uh, eviction moratorium, so a big fraction of their tenants are paying rent. Can they hold up to kind of the stressful environment that we think is coming? Uh, 
Another challenge in this environment for lending to small businesses, and I, I'm not making a policy statement here, but it's, it's just a reality of the situation. So the, a lot of times that's really based on the, the small business owner's uh, credit profile. So sometimes there's other factors there, but that's one of the key drivers. So that the CARES Act really restricted credit bureau reporting on some of the payment relief products, so payment deferral, payment forbearance. So it, in some ways you're, you're flying blind a little bit and the, you don't know if there's a credit, potential credit issue in another product with that individual consumer that in a different environment you would know about. Now, there's good reasons that Congress made that change, but it's, as a lender, it's a reason for caution. But I, I would say kind of thinking about if you're going to continue in that space and not pull back, uh, think about kind of a can the loan hold up to the to the stress that we envision? So uh, reduce loan to value ratios. So property values declining, revenues declining. Can the debt service coverage and LTV requirements hold up? Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the the some of the the issues with the. Uh, you know, uh, trying to hold the line on evictions, right? If you're looking at multifamily types of properties, some maybe some some an, uh, an offset to some of that could be that uh, you know policies that are being out there to prevent people from being evicted from their homes, but at the same time, you know, create a, an issue for for you know assessing vacancy rates, right? For for those types of properties, because the landlords still have to uh, you know pay their pay their bills. Oh yeah, it, uh, absolutely, and it uh, it could kind of drive behavior of kind of the the relief isn't going to the people who need it most. Uh, so people using these these programs, even though they they may not really need it. Uh, yeah, I mean it, it it leads to all kinds of kind of unpredictable behaviors, and we saw some of that in the, mm -hmm. in the Great Financial Crisis or the Great Recession of kind of waves of strategic defaults that we really hadn't seen before in the in the mortgage lending space. Yeah, right. all, all kinds of uh, unpredictable things can happen. No no question. And on the consumer side, I mean mortgage uh, I suspect is probably your 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 largest exposure in your portfolio. Uh we had a Neil Hinduja on our last time it was uh, Freddie Max CRO and he was kind of giving a take sort of from you know, his side of the world there, but I'd be curious to kind of see uh, how you're thinking about managing mortgage exposure as well as some of the other secured assets you were talking about as well. Yeah, sure. So the, the short answer is really that same kind of scenario analysis, stress testing, that, that's our best tool. And uh, some of the foundational pieces there, so uh, your, your models for your mortgage book. So we, we originate mortgage for our portfolio. We also sell it to the GSEs. Uh, so you need to kind of understand that putback risk, that potential putback mm -hmm. risk well, but uh, your models need to be uh, advanced enough to be considering the prepayment risk as well as the default risk. So that competing risk style model, I'd, my view, I mean, I'd, it's really foundational to managing a mortgage book. And then a, a layer below that is uh, it's kind of full doc. So, if, if you, and sort of another lesson learned from the great financial crisis, if you don't have accurate information on your borrower and on your asset, that scenario analysis and stress testing, that's not gonna mean a whole lot. And you're gonna, you're gonna feel like you're flying blind. So part of what gives me a little more comfort is the fact that uh, BECU, I mean, we've stayed full doc so I, I I have a lot more comfort that we we understand our borrower base, our our asset base in that book. Um, another another thought with mortgage, uh, cash out refi. So like like many of the lenders in this space. So if you if you normalize for FICO LTV, so most refi is cash out refi, but. Uh, the refi, refi product has much higher default rates historically as compared to a purchase loan. So we were being quite a bit more cautious with that cash out refi product uh, on home equity. The key there is really to, to manage the quality mix and 
and understanding that so in a benign credit environment, your, your FICO, your kind of propensity of borrower default is going to be your most valuable tool. But as home prices decline, and, and we haven't seen that yet, but at the same time, it's, it's hard to see 10% unemployment sustained without that impacting the real estate market. So I think in 2021, we could see a decline in real estate. So as your real estate prices decline, there's, there can be a shift in consumer behavior where if the property is underwater, that consumer is, is more likely to, to walk away and LTV becomes a more dominant driver of credit default, uh, credit loss as compared to a more benign environment. So again, I, I think short answer is it's, uh, I know it's that same kind of modeling, stress testing scenario, but having the right modeling tool, having the right data environment, uh, thinking about specific concentrations. So do you have, so if, if the aggregate decline in home prices in the scenario you're gonna run is, is 10%, do you have some concentration in a market? So is, is Boeing Everett, is, is Everett going to be a 30 or 40 percent decline? And then uh, I guess a, a last thought on the topic is borrower payment preference. So in the great financial crisis, there was this shift in behavior where consumers would pay their, their credit card, their auto before their mortgage. A lot of times the mortgage was deep underwater, so there was this uh, kind of propensity to, to kind of prioritize their payments. And uh, But I, I think in this scenario with real estate prices, you know, I, I anticipate they're going to hold up much better than certainly that scenario. I think we could see like, what I expect in consumer is the, the credit card and the auto books to have more trouble than the, than the mortgage in terms of where is the consumer going to make their first payment? Yeah, that's that's actually very interesting. I uh, I remember that payment hierarchy issue. There was a big study I think that was done by one I think by TransUnion on that that uh, uh, caught a lot of people by surprise. But uh, when they started seeing that, so it's fascinating that that's the case. A um, couple things, and I, I definitely want to make sure we we have time for for folks with questions, but. Um, you clearly are a survivor from the 08 crisis. Uh, you speak of it uh, quite a bit, and so I think there's there's still a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, many of the practices that you talk about today, scenario analysis and doing it sort of on the fly and refining these things we were doing back then, and it's kind of rather relatively new in some sense, uh, although we've been doing some of that for, for years. But how does this one differ uh, from, you know, what we saw in 08? And, uh, and where do we go from here in terms of where you think things are going to land by the time we get to 2000, end of 2021? Just your own personal views there. Yeah, sure. So some of the key differences. So this, uh, you know, this is not primarily a real estate event. That's one difference, uh, pretty obvious. The, you know, there's been a very high rate of recovery from the, the payment relief or the payment modification programs in lending. That's another key difference. And uh, I, I'm not sure that we as lenders really understand the dynamics of what's going on there beyond just a very large federal stimulus. So now that's another key difference. I think the biggest difference to me is sort of the, the nature of the event. So a, a typical recession, I mean, uh, my own view, there's, there's some element of this economic concept of creative destruction. So. The weaker parts of the economy, the capital is being redeployed from the, the weaker parts to the stronger parts, to the more profitable businesses, the more efficient businesses. Uh, this event, it's it's uh, sort of it's, it's very artificial, and then you have all this federal stimulus on top of it. So I'm sort of wrestling with the question of. Uh, are we are some of the stronger parts of our economy actually being eroded in this cycle, and are we going to come out weaker in some significant way? So, an example of that would be so we're we're losing our I know we talked about it earlier. So our ability to produce aircraft is that going to be important for having a, a healthy, strong economy in 2023? Maybe, maybe not. But it it's it's not a normal 
cycle. This is a very artificial event that I think is distorting our post-COVID economy in a number of ways that we, we haven't identified yet. Uh, so I, I, I know some, some of the lessons learned from that great financial crisis, uh, I don't know, so the limitations of models really respecting, I don't know, we, we really can't model the, the impacts of the federal stimulus. We can run a range of outcomes, but don't, uh, don't have more confidence in your models than they deserve. And then uh, working to maintain a risk culture that allows for kind of open discussions, ongoing review and challenge, and uh, probably a push to overcome the, our, our natural tendency towards complacency and extrapolating the current trend forward. So, I mean, there could be all kinds of surprises coming up with this COVID situation that we as risk managers need to be thinking about to help steer the oil tanker around the iceberg. <laughs> Indeed. You know, you touched on something that, that's near and dear to my heart, but yet uh, those of us that are more on the uh, the quantitative side somewhat uh, may be that's not their, their uh, comparative advantage to begin with. But tell me a little bit about how you approach risk governance, how that risk governance model works at uh, Boeing, because it's, as we both know, it's, it's uh, you can have all the fancy models in the world and all the great data and all these other things in place all the processes and controls, but if you don't have good governance and culture, I, I, it's game over in my mind. So I'd, I'd like to know how you, how, how the company approaches that, how you approach it, how, how does it uh, feel to be a risk manager at a, at a place like Boeing versus a place like um, we both have some shared heritage at before. Right, right. So I, I think our, our structure is, is pretty traditional. So uh, kind of a three lines of defense model. So, uh, risk taking, kind of risk oversight and governance, and then a last is, is audit. So we we have a board of directors. They set a risk appetite, and they're also kind of instrumental in in defining our cultural foundation of kind of open review and challenge, vigorous discussion of, of the risk topic, uh, and then kind of creating space for the the risk team to do its work. Uh, we'll have kind of our second line leaders. So. I'll chair our Enterprise Risk Management Committee, some of my reports, so chairing our Compliance Committee, our Credit Risk Committee, uh, so kind of a traditional structure in that way. We're not a, we're not a trillion dollar asset organization, so we have some, probably a little more blurb between first line and second line in a couple cases. But I, I Cliff, I, I think uh, the point you hit on, and maybe it's our shared history of having worked in uh, places where there wasn't the cultural foundation, but I, I think our real strength at BECU is, is the culture that we have, and it comes from our board, it comes from our executive team. But ha having worked in places where you don't have that cultural foundation that allows for the risk team to do its work and no amount of expertise, data, models is going to fix the risk issues, uh, kind of having some risk experts on our board who have I don't know, experience at uh, places that didn't have the right culture and understand its importance, I think is uh, is really critical and allows us to be effective. And then that that kind of cascaded down to senior management, your, your CEO celebrating the when the risk team is effective as well as when the business side is effective, making it clear to the organization that we that we're, we're balanced and we kind of celebrate both outcomes. Wow, I was, uh, when I hear that, I almost wish I were still on deck somewhere again, if that's the way it's gonna be. Never had that in any places I was at, but that's very interesting. I mean, it, it is, it, it's so critical, right? Um, and of course, uh, I'll just, uh, uh, Bill Longbreak, right, is uh, one of your board members and he turns out to be one of our, uh, he's uh, an executive in residence and an alum from, from the business school here. So. Uh, uh, and John McMurray that, that, that we know so well, um, good people that, that to have on that board. Um, let me let me stop there, just in the interest of time, to kind of throw some questions out to folks. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of look through some of these. Um, we've got a question here that um, I'm having a hard time reading my my Q and A a little bit here. But will tenants not renewing leases and not having? Let me see if I can get this this to kind of scroll down a little bit better for me. 
and not ha uh, oh and not paying rent on current leases affect the ability a little, a little hard for me to get this to affect the ability of apartment owners to meet loan obligations and thereby put stress on your capital. Did you catch all that? Uh, yeah, so the uh, so if the tenant uh, yeah doesn't doesn't pay their rent or then the uh, kind of the, the owner of that property, I mean at, at some point it it will put stress on their ability to make payment on the loan. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, and then that, that could, I mean, in some cases we have uh, additional layers of recourse back to the, I don't know, the, the owner of the property. Uh, in some cases, like, like other end lenders, it's, it's just the property we have. So yeah, that, that could absolutely put stress on us. And there's, uh, I don't know, and it, you need to understand kind of each property is unique. Some properties are, are going to be much more impacted than others. I don't know whether it's multifamily, whether it's office, whether it's retail. Uh, every property is going to be different, and you need to do kind of specific analysis for each situation. Yeah, that's. that's, I, know, that's I, I don't know if that was responsive, but uh, yeah, absolutely, it'll place stress on us. Yeah, you, uh, and your point there about I mean, a commercial a commercial underwriting is such a different animal altogether than the consumer side, right? And it's that high touch. You all, it's it's so bespoke in some in some respects, right? That you have to run the numbers, but uh, it's it's also important to kind of know what that where that property is. Or you remember back in the day too, where we were at that you know having people that are just focused on a particular. Uh, area. So if you've got properties in Oregon, for example, uh, you probably have people that are experts in understanding sort of the nature of the of the business and cash flows that are going on in that area, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. That I know it's the it's the local expertise. It's understanding is the, I know is the major tenant a, a grocery store that's really healthy and has a huge business right now, or is it? Uh, I know a big box sporting goods retailer that's just being destroyed by Amazon right now. So it's understanding the specifics, kind of when they put the debt, you know, their various covenants, uh, what their recovery plans look like, how strong is the operator. Sometimes hmm. a very strong operator can help recover a commercial loan through their ability to manage and, and find good new tenants. And uh, so really understanding that borrower relationship. Now, having said that, there are there are lenders in the space who treat multifamily like it's a jumbo mortgage, and it's really right. kind of commoditized and and ratio driven. I I know I suspect they're going to run into some some challenges. They they may come out fine in the end, but uh, it, it'd be a harder spot to be in as compared to kind of our approach, which is more high touch, less scalable. Right. There has been this move over the last number of years, right, that uh, where we went from mortgage, where we would start to, you know, use automated underwriting scoring systems to kind of evaluate the borrowers and whatnot, uh, up to like 40 unit properties. And then this five to 50 ish space is kind of like there's some data now. There has been some data to be able to do similar kinds of things to a limited degree. And it's still a different, it's kind of a hybrid still, right, in that space. And then when you get beyond the 50, it's, it becomes a totally different animal back to, Human beings evaluating and making those trade-offs, right? And then, yeah, that I mean, you're right. That that 50 plus. I mean, some of these kind of marquee properties. I mean, it can be very volatile. And yeah, we've had a lot of new construction yeah. in in our in our areas over the last 10 years. So, growth of Amazon, growth of Microsoft. We have Facebook, Google. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, mean, I think we, we've stayed out of that space for the most part, but it, it really takes detailed understanding. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's one for you. What's your view on the economic recover, uh, recovery? Is it a V, an L, or some other shape? And what factors lie behind that outcome, would you say? Yeah, so I, I'm going to throw you a curveball. So it's, uh, I think it's a K. So you have, you have kind of this group that they're tech workers. They they work at Amazon and cloud services. They own stock or this group that's doing better than ever. Then you have the, the service economy workers, the restaurant workers, the uh, dry cleaner, auto services, and they're they're having a really tough time. And it's not clear when things are going to get better. Then on top of that, my my own view, I, I think we're headed towards 
this environment where it's not clear more stimulus is coming, how much stimulus. It's easy for me to see uh, the executive branch, Congress in a deadlock, uh, pre-election, post-election, thinking about this. So, and then the seasonality of COVID as well. So I think superimposed on that K, not a typical recession at all. You could have another wave of decline coming, especially for credit, absent kind of clear direction on, on additional stimulus, which we don't have right now. Right, right. And uh, another question here related uh, somewhat to this, and I want to tag off of it, is stress testing often uses historical events to model off of. How are you stress testing in today's environment with so many unknowns? I mean, it is a, it is this the imbalance between, you know, uh, art and science, right? The modeling efforts themselves, the science component, but it seems to me like there's got to have to be a lot of judgmental overlays and, you know, expertise. It's kind of just looking at these things differently. Yes, yeah, so our, our, our modeling, our stress testing, it's really based on, uh, it's primarily historically driven. So what that's led to, so, and not just for the, the stress cases, but for the expected cases, we've come out a lot more conservative than what's, what's played out. And, and the difference is kind of the, the stimulus programs, the support programs, those are so hard to model because you don't know how effective they're going to be, how effective they're uh, will they be deployed effectively? So, I mean, we saw PPP loans. There was a big backlog. They ran out of funds. You can't model those kinds of things. So, uh, when you kind of work from primarily history to to get your correlations, uh, how the macroeconomy impacts your portfolio, I think everybody's ended up at a much conserv more conservative spot. You try to overlay judgment, but I. I I can't say we've cracked that nut and come out in an accurate way. So we'll we'll just we'll show a wide range, but certainly the unadjusted gives us a very conservative re result. And and so you know, I'm presuming you you're probably taking a, 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 a presumably like we did out of the out of the, the crisis a, a very conservative view uh, on what this downside could look like and the kind of managing to that. Right, and, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll have kind of a, an expected case, and then yeah, much more severe cases, and we want to make sure that kind of that uh, uh, ten percent likely stress scenario that that's very survivable. So we're managing our portfolios, our our credit portfolio, our liquidity to to come through that without issue. And you really need, I mean, there's so much uncertainty in this environment that you really want to be thinking about it in that way. Has the, uh, has your regulator, the National Credit Union uh, administrator, administrator, have they uh, been also kind of asking you to perform separate tests that they're coming up with, or is this kind of being more proactive on the, on the credit union side itself than on the regulatory side? It's, uh, I guess uh, it's, it's a mix of both. So on the, uh, so we perform kind of our version of the Dodd-Frank Act stress test. It was, uh, and then some versions are, are idiosyncratic. So we were able to work with them to tailor some of the versions, some of the scenarios we run uh, for kind of that broader Dodd-Frank Act stress test uh, that the NCUA has implemented to be tailored to COVID. Mm -hmm. And then we, and then they also see the the scenarios that we run ourselves. So. Let's say it's partly them, uh, and then probably mostly at this point driven by I know, our own analysis of the situation. Um, and, and from a loan loss reserving standpoint, it's probably feed into that as well, right? So you probably kind of migrated over to the Cecil. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, no, we haven't. And uh, credit unions got put on a different timeline, so we don't start Cecil until 2023, which wow. is which is kind of both both uh, good and bad. So the, uh, I mean, as, as a risk manager, I mean, my, my inclination is to build up reserves going into a downturn, which Cecil allows you to do in a pretty clean way. Mm -hmm. The incurred loss model, which we're still on, you need to be able to show that the loss is already incurred and on the balance sheet. And it's uh, without kind of the delinquencies materializing yet, it's, it's, it's harder to do. So. I mean, that was that was the the thing that we were in at the uh, before the crisis, right? And this uh, 
this uh, issue with the, the the incurred loss approach being more pro-cyclical in nature was always the bane of our, our existence, that you couldn't really kind of, uh, from a gap accounting standpoint, uh, put enough reserves on or, or justify that from an empirical basis based on what you see. And uh, by the time the crisis is on you, you can't put enough on um, because right. it's getting ahead of you. So now Cecil, the current expected credit loss methodology, which again gets us at least a little bit further toward an expected loss type of an economic concept of an expected loss anyway, um, is, is better. But that's interesting that that uh, I, I guess I had forgotten that, that, you, that you had somewhat of a reprieve from uh, the rest of uh, the banking sector to kind of implement that. I'm guessing though you're probably in the works of, of putting putting the framework and the, all the infrastructure together for that though. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. So we'll uh, we'll transition to that. Uh, I don't know, possibly we'll early adopt, but I think most likely we and other credit unions will be 2023. The, yeah, CESOL has its own. Right. I mean, it, it could be more volatile. So if I mean, if there is a, a vaccine, there could be big swings in uh, reversing those reserves that have been created. We, we, I, I think we've been uh, kind of appropriate and probably conservative and prudent in our reserving to the extent we can. Yeah, this, but, uh, this next question, yeah, yeah I hear that. It's, it's, it's tricky. Um, other question that, I, that I'm seeing here is um, back to something we talked about at the beginning. So what operational risks have been front and center for you during this time, and how are you handling them? Uh, yeah, so that early stage, I, I kind of talked about that with uh, the health and safety and the you know, rapid product deployment, remote work. Uh, right now, it's it's our vendor partners. So they're some of the smaller ones. Their their viability, their health. That's something we're looking at closely. Uh, fraud is another. Hmm. Another case where, so if you have your middle office, your back office all working from home, historically they've been in, in office buildings or around other, other workers, they're less likely to, or you're less likely to have the event of kind of stealing customer information. So any financial institution or a lot of companies generally are exposed to this. So I think there's more potential for internal fraud in this environment. We haven't seen any of that yet, but I, I have to think that's a that's a difference that we're going to see or the industry is going to see. Uh, other operational risks, so kind of in, in the fraud vein, so fraud in the PPP program and the you know, even on the enhanced unemployment benefits, there was a lot more theft of identity for the purpose of hijacking those unemployment benefits, and you probably saw that in the press and. and Banks and credit unions were really the the intermediary on that that was used by the fraudsters. But uh, yeah, probably fraud is the other big trend that we're looking at. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, I'll, I'll, I have one last question for you uh, before we sort of uh, conclude our session today, and that is, how have your folks been holding up, the risk folks in general? I mean, I remember back in my time in 08, I mean, everybody's hair was on fire and it was pretty stressful for quite a long time and it was like people working around the clock. I mean, how how do you, how are they doing, again, from a work from home type of an environment, and uh, how do you manage that to keep them uh, all healthy and sane? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's a great question, and that is something that uh, that I wrestle with day to day. It's, it's the risk folks and just about everybody else. I think we've all been working longer hours for a long period of time. Uh, we've been encouraging people to take their vacations, uh, recover, but the, the pace of change, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, right now we're dealing with the wildfires up here and yeah. mandatory evacuations in some of our locations, people working from home mm. without power or things like that. But it's, uh, yeah, it, it's trying to create, uh, really encourage, take that time off. Other people are gonna cover for you just because it, it's clear that I, I don't know, a lot of people need need a break after six months of COVID. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I think we'll end on that note today, John. Uh, I know you're a busy guy. You're out there doing a lot of things for Boeing, so I appreciate it. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us and uh, giving us your wisdom on all things risk related to today's environment. Thanks so much. Yeah, glad to do it. Uh, nice talking to you.
Okay, take care. And thank you everyone for being on today. And uh, we'll just kind of conclude our session. And thank you again for, for uh, being part of this.